Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to church this morning. Um, this morning, I have the privilege of actually preaching through a passage of scripture that's that's meant a lot to me personally and uh, within my own life. It's some it's a passage of scripture I've turned to quite often uh, when I've when I've been struggling, and God has refreshed me in it. And so, um, it's actually a treat. Uh, I get to preach uh, one of my favorite passages of scripture, and so. I'm looking forward to it, looking forward to encouraging you in, in what I have learned and, and God has, has taught me through this passage. So it's Ephesians 3, and we're looking at verses 1 to 21. We're looking at the whole chapter, and we'll be concentrating on, on the last number of verses that are there. And um, Again, it's it's just something that in this time and what's going on with, with life and, and our own culture and community, it's, it's something that I have found very encouraging. So let's look at Ephesians uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 21. It says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which is not made known to the people of in other generations as it has now been revealed by the spirit of god's holy apostles and prophets this mystery is that through the gospel the gentiles are heirs together with israel members together of one body and shares together in the promise in christ jesus i became a servant of this gospel by the gift of god's grace given me through the working of his spirit although i am less than the least of all of the lord's people this grace was given me to preach to the gentiles the boldness the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of his mystery, which by ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that, is a, that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derive its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all of the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power, that is at work within us, and to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. In verse 1, Paul starts his prayer. He says, for this reason. But then he stops and goes back and recaps the previous two chapters. He then picks up his thought again in, in verse 14. In Bible study language, these are called parentheses. That's where you start one topic, introduce another one, and then start with that topic again. So in verses 2 to 13 are the, the recap or the reminder of what he has already taught them. Paul thought it was appropriate just to go over this one more time before he went ahead. The first thing he mentions is the mystery. This mystery is that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. Now, the reason why he goes over this is because it's such a huge deal. It was such a significant thing. For thousands of years, God's people, the Jews, have had an exclusive relationship with God. But now in Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ, that all changed. Now God's focus and attention are on those who know Christ. There's no longer any divisions or segregation between classes and races or even genders, all can be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
We are all now one body under the headship of Jesus Christ. We are united as one. As the body, Paul reminds them of the riches they have in Christ. Now these are not things that we have earned, but they are given to us. We are given them at salvation. They are a free gift pack, if you will. You know those free things you get, you know, when you check into a big fancy hotel and they have this gift basket waiting there for you? Part of that gift basket that we receive in Jesus Christ is this access we have to the Father. There's no longer any barriers between them. As God's children, declared righteous, called saints, we are the redeemed. We can now come boldly to our Heavenly Father, who is eager to hear from us as His people. From Ephesians chapter 1 at the beginning all the way to 3.13, He's been giving the basic truths of the Christian faith. He's been talking about who we are in Christ and the limitless resources we have in him. But from verse 14 and on, Paul exhorts them not just to know these truths, but to live them out. Paul, in these remaining passages, urges the Ephesians to live in the full power and effectiveness of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a beautiful pastoral prayer. Beautiful prayer about the full of the and full of the riches of truth and uplifting encouragement. Each sentence of this prayer leads to the next and builds on the point that is previously there. And if you follow the lead that is there, if you follow it to its progression, it leads to a glorifying Christian. Paul prays for their inner strength of spirit, for the indwelling of Christ in a believer's heart, for the incomprehensible love to permeate their lives, and for them to have God's own fullness in and through them, and to bring glory to him, and for it to be manifested and proclaimed in the church. That's what he prays for his congregation, and that's my prayer for us as well. So let's look at each one of these different points. The first thing Paul prays for is the Spirit's power. And this is in verses 14 to 16. Paul says, For this reason, because of all this truth, because of everything they have learned and the salvation that they have in Jesus Christ, I pray, he says, that they would understand the vastness of their oneness. Each of us, as part of the church, the family of God, derive our family name from Christ. From believing Jews in the Old Testament to the Gentile church of today, those in heaven, those still alive on earth, each of us have the same Heavenly Father. We are all one in Jesus Christ, all a part of the family of God. Paul prays, that each of us would be granted strength in our inner man, as being part of this family, in our inner man, that we would be strengthened, that God would give us strength granted to us from his riches. Now, if you can imagine God giving us strength according to his riches, so that as we learn to rely on him, as we learn to walk with him, we are granted strength not from our own weakness or our own willpower, but instead God's infinite power and strength through his Holy Spirit is given to each one of us to endure whatever hardship or struggles that we're going through. Now here's a, a hard math question for those students who are very eagerly learning in their homeschooling math lessons these days. The question is about infinity. If you divide infinity by 5, what do you get? You get infinity. How about if you divide infinity by 100, or even a million, what do you get? Well, you still get infinity. So God, being infinite in his power, can give each one of us all of himself and still have enough for everyone else. Through his Holy Spirit, he wants to give us power through his strength. And again, we don't get this power piece by piece or earn it over time or attain it somehow by new spiritual blessings. 
Each believer in Jesus Christ receives this at salvation. Paul is exhorting them to tap into this infinite resource that we can live by the power given us in our inner being. Now this is not a brute strength power. That's not a power that we're talking about. It's not a power to overpower physically, but instead it is this gentle inner strength of resolve and confidence and a sure foundation. We are strengthened in our inner man as we yield our will to the Holy Spirit. As we die to ourselves and give control over to God, as we meditate on his word and live according to it, as we learn the will of God and do it every day, as we learn to fellowship with God in prayer and focus on who he is, we can do amazing things, not because of our ability, but because of his power strengthening us. Next, in verse 17, he talks about Christ's indwelling of us. Paul, Paul's prayer was that Christ would dwell in their hearts by faith. Now, for some, this has been a bit of a stumbling block. All through Scripture, we are told that Christ comes to reside in each one of us at the moment of salvation. Then why, as he is preaching to a Christian church, would he be saying that he wanted Christ to dwell in their hearts? What does that mean? Now, as I have been taught, and, and I have taught others, that one verse taken out of context doesn't, doesn't change the meaning of all of Scripture. But instead, we are to look at it, examine it, and study it for what it really means. Now, look at the Greek word that he has translated here to dwell has a different understanding, has a different meaning to it. So I want to give you a little definition. It's a, it's a compound word. It means to come down, and it means to inhabit a house. That's a compound word. Now, if you put it together and, and you settle it and you, and you translate it into what makes sense, it's that Christ would come and make himself at home in your heart. Paul's prayer for them was that God in Jesus Christ would be at home in our hearts. At home. Now, have you ever been invited to somebody's house, and even though they invited you there and they invited you in, you just didn't really feel welcome? You didn't feel comfortable there? And on the other hand, when you go to somebody else's place, you immediately just feel at home. At home. Now, what was the difference? Well, oftentimes it's the attitude of the homeowner. Christ wants to be invited to be made at home in our hearts, to move about freely, to feel comfortable, to have control over the things that happen in our lives, to make changes that is as necessary. Is Christ at home in your heart? Or is he just stopping in for a visit? Next, he talks about the abundance of, of love that we have in Jesus Christ. And that's verses 17 to 19. Being made strong inwardly by God's Spirit leads to Christ being at home in our hearts, which leads to a love that is incomprehensible. He says that we are to be rooted, to be established in the love. It means to have it down, not just knowing about it in our minds, but knowing it by experience and by action. As we continue to yield to Christ, as we continue to walk in Him and be strengthened by Him, we get this great understanding of just how amazing this love is that He has for us. He says, together with all of God's people, it means that this love, this amazing love that we have in Jesus is going to take all of us to understand. And it's something we can all understand, not just the elite few, but all of us can understand. And we'll take the experience and understanding of each one of us to truly measure this immeasurable love that we have in Jesus Christ. Now this love, this immeasurable love, is not our kind of love, but instead it is the love of Christ in and through us and to his church. It'll take all of us together to grasp to reach for, to try to attain to an understanding of this great love that he has for us. 
The next, Paul talks about it in the last part of verse 19. He talks about the fullness of God, that this love that God pours into our life. The process of striving together with other Christians to understand this immeasurable love that God has lavished on us, this love that now flows through us by the Holy Spirit, fills us to overflowing. Now this is the word picture that it paints. It says, in the Greek it means to be full, yes, but to always be being filled. So you're always full and being filled at the same time. Now what I picture is this, this Dixie cup here. Now if I was to take this Dixie cup and I was to fill it with a fire hose, this cup would continue to be full and being filled at the same time. And that's what it's like for each one of us as people to try to understand the fullness of who God is and the fullness of his love is that we are constantly being filled and filled at the same time. There's that old Sunday school song I learned when I was young, my cup is full and running over since the Lord saved me, right? My cup is full. To wrap this up, Paul again talks about the Lord's glory in verses 20 and 21. Paul, when he is talking about this amazing love, can't help but burst into a praise anthem. To him who is able to do more than we could ever hope or imagine, God is able to do more, not according to our faith, our talents. He is able to do great things in us and through us according to his power in us. God's work is not hinging on my skill, or my talent or ability, but instead it hinges on my willingness to be set myself aside and let God work through me. When the Holy Spirit has empowered us, when Christ is indwelling us, love has mastered us, and God has filled us with his fullness, then he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever hope or even imagine. It is only as we yield the whole of who the church is, all of what we are, that he fills us and uses us and does exceedingly more than we could ever imagine. And then God is praised in his church through all generations forever and ever. What's the application to Paul's prayer for us was that we would understand and know, and not just comprehend, but really know the love of Christ and yield to him and be filled by him, and he will work in and through us. I want to read just the last few verses here again. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to all the measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I hope that you are encouraged. I hope that you are built up. I hope that you are strengthened in the word that we together in, in all of this is plural. It's not singular. All of this is speaking to the church as a whole. Us together. That we would be united in the love of Christ and see him do amazing things amazing and measurable things, more than we could even imagine. So as we close today, I just want to close in prayer. 
I just want to pray this prayer for each one of us. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the gift of salvation that we can be one family together. And Lord, as we move forward, as we seek to know you, to be filled by you, Lord, we look forward to seeing the amazing things that you can accomplish through your church here in Riley and, and in our county around Tofield and Round Hill, Holden. Lord, that you would do immeasurably more than we could ever hope or imagine. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for the blessings of your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just want to dismiss you guys and encourage you guys that to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, for an ever and ever. Amen. We are dismissed.